Thanks. Yeah. When you don't give uh, people a title, I guess they make one up for you. There is there is no precursor org, and I'm not CEO of it, but it's fine. Um, yeah. Thanks for uh, uh, having me here. I guess to program committee. I always feel a little bit of an imposter because this is an open source software conference, and I'm like, well, what do I talk about here? Um, as you saw, I had a little struggle setting up the. I had a live demo I was going to show, but then I, I had a video back. Anyways, long story. It's not happening, but we'll talk about it anyways. And uh, and apologize for the font mismatch because I'm now my, my slides are on a computer that doesn't have the right fonts, so things are going to render weird. Anyway, so uh, I, the the topic of the talk is uh, debugging Rust, actually just generic code with Verilog. If people don't know what Verilog is, Verilog is a, a language for describing hardware. Um, it's basically in the in the line stupid open hardware tricks, um, trying to trying to explain a little bit what open hardware is. So a lot of people, I think most people, when they hear open hardware, the reaction is like, that's cute, you know, but what do, I, what do I do with it, right? I don't actually have the time to build this thing. I don't actually really care to fix it. You know, they just want the thing to be delivered at their doorstep now, and they want it cheap, right? So if you had, like, the option to have buy a house that had the blueprints and a buy a house that did not have the blueprints, that's not a, it doesn't matter to most people, right? You know, the fact that you could have the source to your house doesn't move the needle for for um, most situations. But there's some things you can do with open hardware if you're not into hardware. So the like one of the typical canonical things that we all you know jump up and down and scream about in the open hardware community is that oh well you know you can do security audits, right? There's this whole principle, Kirchhoff's principle, not to be confused with Kirchhoff's first law. Um, Kirchhoff's principle, which is that, uh, you know, there's nothing up my sleeve. The idea that if you're going to have a security system, uh, then disclosing the full function of how the lock works and where the tumblers are, the pins are, allows you to make an accurate assessment of, of the security parameters. Um, but, you know, in reality, again, this is an application that's mostly just for paranoid people and not cases like me. Um, so maybe a thing that's a little more relevant to more people in this room are things like um, specter mitigations. Um, still largely a theoretical area, but how many people here know what specter is in terms of a vulnerability? Okay, a few hands. I'll, I'll go over that very bri briefly. Basically, there's a class of attacks that can happen on your laptop, the machine you're using right now in your lap, where um, information about a secret computation can leak through what's called a timing site channel. Sometimes depending on the data you're processing, the, the data can process very quickly or it can take a little bit longer. If you measure the amount of time, it can leak, for example, information about your password or your secret keys. The reason why that happens is because even though machines have this abstract model called the instruction set architecture, like, oh, I have an IX86 or I have an ARM on an M1 or something like this, on the inside, the time it takes to execute instruction varies quite greatly. And it depends upon these tricks they play. Um, do we have a laser pointer or anything like this? I think this is, is this a laser pointer here? Me and my old eyes can't see. Oh, there you go. Excellent. So like, um, this is an example of uh, what's called a branch predictor. So every single time you run through a piece of code, it will go ahead and remember the last state that you took for going through a loop. And it'll generally say, well, since you went through a loop and you went this way, the last loop, you're more likely to go that way than the other way. And so we'll speculate ahead and try to save you some time and, 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 and guess that that's what you're going to do. That internal state becomes a problem because that's the, that's the vector for leaking the information about your key. If we had the source code for your CPU, we could actually have the compiler write provable automatic mitigations for Spectre. In other words, that this whole thing about like this patch chain you have every like two or three months to patch new Spectre vulnerability, this whole industry of researchers that's now employed basically finding the series of, of, of vulnerabilities could be worked around if guys like Intel and AMD would just um, share the source code and then we could actually write compilers instead of having to reverse engineer this whole pipeline, right? But this is still largely a theoretical thing because no CPU that really actually matters that you're using on your lap has that available. But that's something that I think that would be interesting to most people. Another thing that you can do uh, with open hardware, it turns out, is you can do debugging in performance profile of code, which is something that's a little more software relevant, right? Um, so. The source code of a CPU, this is an example here of a, like, you know, some source code, can be run and turn into this display here, which probably a lot of you aren't familiar with, but a guy like me would, would feel very comfortable looking at this. This is a set of waveforms that describes the state of the CPU. So we're looking at, for example, the 
the data being fetched out of the register file, the instruction being executed at this point in time, like for example, whether these are compressed instructions or not, legal instructions, is it a multiply, pipeline exceptions, um, the virtual page numbers, the state of the AXI bus on the inside, that's all visible when you run at the hardware level using this type of uh, uh, simulation. So it's an extremely powerful view on the inside of a, of a computer, and you can use this to actually debug code. So just to review what the typical approaches are to debugging, um, you know, print statements. How many people have debugged by print statements here? Everybody, right? Like, it's, uh, it's awesome, it's tried and true, like, it's like, even in the most minimal setups, when you have almost nothing available, a print statement will generally work. It's inoperable, ASCII comes out, you can pipe it to a Python script, you can wrap, you can, you can you know, automate other things. So it's awesome, right? But the, you know, it's limited for debugging very complex and concurrent environments. Anyone try to print debug two threads running at once, we'll see a garble of stuff emerging on their console of two things um, um, talking on top of each other. Not to mention the incipient performance problems of trying to talk to a 115 kilobaud UART uh, when, when your CPU is running on at a gigahertz. So then, you know, we have more sophisticated stuff like, oh, we have an IDE and, uh, you know, you're debugging, you're going line by line and see all the state of your Python code, wherever it is, GDB and all this sort of stuff. It's really awesome. We can have it. But then there's a question of who debugs the debugger, right? So when you come up with a new platform, it's actually a lot of work to try and instrument to, try to, to bring in that, um, the debugger. And uh, again, even when you're in a multi-process system, these debuggers, aren't a straight shot. You have to be able to attach to the right process, switch through. There's overhead that's incurred in doing that, especially um, when you get into things like performance profiling. So people who've done performance profiling may be familiar with this guy here, this flame graph. Basically, a, a call stack shows you how much time is being spent in every single um, call all the way out to the auto routines. And you can sort of determine very quickly which routines you should uh, focus on, on optimizing. It's very, very powerful. It has beautiful output. But there, it can have artifacts due to overhead. So there's, there's plenty of stories of people like, you know, I put flame graph on my thing and I spent all my time optimizing and I found out that I was actually just optimizing the system call for getting flame graph to run, right? Or something like this. It's like the overhead of actually getting it to, to work can be a little bit tricky. So there's a kind of an art that comes around doing really good performance profiling. You have to use hardware counters, you have to use instrumented kernels, you have to go ahead and there's a whole bunch of different tricks that come into play to make sure you're actually capturing the events of interest. If you're going across system call boundaries, so you're bouncing between the kernel and the user space and you want to sort of plot that, that introduces a new layer of complexity because you're in different memory spaces, you can't correlate timestamps as easily. Um, and, then, uh, and then, you know, a whole bunch of other types of problems that happen when you're in concurrent spaces. So, so this, if people do do it all the time on really big systems. But it is, and it's, it's not obvious how to do it, and, it's not, and you have to set it up. It takes quite a bit of time. So just a, a quick review. So the niches that are not kind of handled particularly well by the approaches that I've, I've overviewed are things like the early boot. So when your, your machine is, hits the reset vector and you have to debug it, how do you debug the reset vector, right? That's a very, very tricky problem. You don't have print even. You don't have other things. What do you do in that kind of case? Transitions between the user space and kernel, or machine mode and kernel. So if uh, machines start life you know, with physical memory, they don't know about virtual memory, they don't know about your process space, they don't know about your kernel, whatever it is, you have to teach the machine where the programs are, you have to teach the machine where the page tables are gonna be, and you have to tell it, okay, on this one magic instruction, and we're gonna have the program counter magically teleport from this address to this address, but everything's fine, it's totally okay. And the debugger is gonna not deal with that very well, it turns out. And so then there's a whole bunch of other uh, performance tuning things that you have to do. Like if you're going across system calls, that's very difficult. There's a whole class of um, performance tuning, what I call Heisenbugs. They're things that when you try to instrument them, they change. So for example, if you want to debug a cache or a, a translation local side buffer performance issue, just the instructions you add to go ahead and try and extract those can affect the behavior of the cache or the TLB and, the, and you're no longer um, uh, able to see it. And there's also sort of a, an issue with reproducibility. So if you have a regression and you found it and you think you fixed it, how do you later on know that you fixed it? So reproducibility is a thing that a lot of people don't talk about, but I, particularly when you're debugging things at the hardware level, you want to be able to go back and review the logs. So that the solution that I've been working with to try and get around this is, is simulating a full stack 
open hardware system. So when I say full stack, I mean not just like the CPU, but I'm talking about the memory model, the bus model, the peripherals, everything, right? So, so from, from, from the reset vector onwards, we're able to get basically a cycle accurate overview of all the overhead incurred in the system. All this gets bundled together and thrown into this magic box called a simulator. We met, we combine it with our OS and application code um, as it loads it, as it just loads in the artifact for that. And it, this grinds for a while and produces a file that contains all the machine state from reset to the point of interest, right? So it's like multiple gigabytes of data, but it has everything the machine has done, all the, all the decisions that were made up until that point. And then you can go ahead and dig through that with the waveform viewer later on. Um, so just briefly, it sounds a little magical that we can have such a comprehensive model, but this is where the models come from. In, in particular, um, I design open hardware systems from the ground up. So for me, this is a little bit easier. I have, I use an open source CPU core called the VEX RISP. I have a bus, the Axie, so the interconnect on the inside or from using Wishbone. It all comes for free as open source. If you're dealing with ARM or someone like this, good luck. Um, peripheral models, I write all my peripheral models or I borrow other people's, that's all open source. It becomes a little dicey on the memory because you have to deal with vendor models. So, for example, if you are simulating SpyROM or something like this and you want to get cycle accurate behavior on the SpyROM, it turns out actually, if you go to Macronix, you can just download a Verilog model of most of the Spy parts, which is really cool. So, I can actually get cycle accurate interaction with the with the with the uh, with those and then some ram vendors will also give you abstract models of the ram as well um, and there's some decent for standards like dram and stuff there are standard models you can just pull and use for that so you can get cycle accurate all the way down to the to where the code is coming from and where the ram's coming from um the simulator itself that uh we have kind of been trying to use is is called verilator um it's not actually a full spec compliant Verilog simulator. It's actually more of like a, it can run sort of uh, gate level models of devices. If you have something that gives you an abstract model, so it's like a behavioral model where it says, you, you know, if you're in the reset state, then all this section of the thing magically turns off, but they don't actually instantiate that at the level of gates, that will that will screw up Verilator. So there's a whole class of useful models that Verilator can't run. If you run into that, um, then I fall back on some very compliant simulator like Xilinx XSIM, which is unfortunately closed source, but it actually can actually handle those models correctly. It runs uh, quite a bit slower, but it, but it, at least I can get it to run. The other problem with Verilator is, I mean, it, you can go to the web page, website for Verilator. It does a great pitch for itself, so I won't pitch it for it. Um, but the other problem with it is it's a real big pain in the ass to set up. It's ba basically transpiling your Verilog to C code, and you have to wrap it in the wrapper, and you have to throw it in this whole test framework and then run it. There's a, there's a whole set of tools to deal with that. But once you get through all of that, you get a cycle accurate, harder model, and a fast simulator. You can boot your OS entirely in simulation. So this is a, this is a log that's actually generated by not from monitoring hardware, but we're actually pulling out the machine statements and, and capturing them into a, into a buffer. Takes about five minutes to to boot, about 14 million cycles, so about 140 milliseconds of runtime, which is enough for us to completely copy the kernel in, the user programs in, um, and run uh, some useful applications in that amount of time. Uh, so it's about a 2000x slowdown over real time, right? So you're not going to go ahead and run Doom in this or something like that. I mean, you could, you just wait a long time, but 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 it's good enough for 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 getting into some real. like uh, loader issues. So this is an example of uh, what you can do. You can sort of visualize system call overhead. This is, again, our wonderful waveform view. Up here I have the vision uh, visualization of the SRAM bus. So there's a traffic on the SRAM. Where you see the bright green, that's actually where the SRAM is active. We see it sort of dim colored. There's like no activity on the SRAM bus. So you can already get an idea of like where we're using the caches. When this bus is, is not active, that means the caches are actually hitting. And when this bus is active, it means we're missing on the caches a lot, right? And then uh, we do a trick where we take the program counter and we plot it as a graph relative to the, the magnitude of the program counter. So this kind of spiky little graph is actually like the trajectory of the code going through the executable generally it tends to go up because programs go from low to high in terms of execution. And every now and then you see these spikes that go up and down and those spikes are to kind of library calls that tend to get glommed onto the back end of the executable at the end of the day. And we can actually trace through 
like say, okay, here's a particular uh, call to, for example, uh, just a delay function. This is the message send. We activate a thread. We go ahead and run the user code. We go back to the kernel, so on and so forth. So we can actually see with very, very fine granularity everything that's going on through this whole transition. It's normally it'd be really difficult to visualize, and this all happens over a period of 174 microseconds, so 117,000 machine calls. Uh, mach uh, machine cycles. Another thing you can do is you can inspect like page table faults and cache misses. So this is an example of uh, a transition right out of kernel mode into uh, user mode code. And, and you can see that actually the program kind of just stays flat for a long period of time. Why does it stay flat for so long? You say, oh, actually the MME is refilling. It's doing a page table walk. Grabbing the page tables out, loading it. We're, we're, we're pulling the instructions in here. And then finally we, we run the instruction there. Next one, next one, next one. Okay, cache miss. Next one. Next one, next one, cache miss, next one, next one. And then finally, we're hitting in the cache here. You can see this sort of like repeated pattern that's we're in a, in a loop that's cache hitting all the time. So you can sort of see this all um, coming out of the system. So in order to facilitate the, the usability of this, and this is where we're getting into where I wish I had, um, hopefully the, the video or the demo would have worked. Um, we actually, I, I wrote a little extension to the waveform viewer where you can basically mouse over this and it'll actually uh, browse through the assembly code real time. So you know where you are once you're looking inside of that machine code. Basically, this, this GTK wave is one of those really, when I was like playing around with it, it felt very homey. It's like 90s era C code. Like, you know, I remember back in the day when we didn't have like bounded arrays and structures and we just had to rely upon like naming conventions to make sure we didn't mess up. So it was, it was but the great thing about C code is you can just jump in there and just instrument anything. It's like there are no rules, no, no problems. So I just stuck a, a UDP stack inside of there and just blast what the mouse over is putting out a port and then I have a Python script listen to that port and then uh, go to the right line of the code at the end of the day. You can, you can scan the QR codes and look at it. Um, does this, oh, hey, look, the video plays. So this is, um, so this is a transition from, uh, from uh, you know, uh, user to kernel space. And, you can see here as I as I mouse over and click, it's automatically going to the location in kernel code um, that's going. And so here's the trap code that's running. You can see it's it's doing all the things that you would expect in the traps, storing the registers and so on and so forth. And I'm scrolling around and just kind of zooming out and trying to trying to get a little more on the screen here so you can see what's going on. And there you go, the, there's more of the trap code that's running. Um, and the one thing I want to emphasize is that this is, you don't have to just go forward in time, you can go backwards in time. So when you find the particular artifact of interest, you can just scroll back in time and find what caused it. So a lot of times, we're not running a simulation over, even though you say, oh, it takes five minutes to run a simulation, I spend two hours analyzing a trace, because it's all there. I don't have to run it again. I don't have to go ahead and put in a print statement. I don't have to go ahead and rerun it and break or something because the machine state was lost. It's all in this particular file. And so you can see here, we're looking at the, SATP, the process ID, whatever. So that's the, you know, it's, that's an idea of what the debugging experience looks like. The, the, but the interesting part is this file exists on my computer, and I was going to show a demo where I was just going to load it up and, and zoom back and forth. In. So it's not like I have to run the program. It's just a static offline analysis. You could write other scripts and tools to go ahead and figure out what's going on from a single run. So that 2000x overhead sounds pretty awful, but when you consider what you can do with the logs at the end of the day, um, it's not so bad. So um, Let's see, I'm almost done and almost on time. So, uh, so th this particular technique, I would say, is really useful for debugging things like uh, bootloader issues. So there's, like I said, there's a magic event where you pivot from machine mode to virtual mode. Um, this is super handy because the simulator itself doesn't care whether you're machine mode or virtual mode. There's no sort of controversy over where you're putting your performance counters or how they're mapped or whatever it is. You can just walk right through that transition back and forth, back and forth, scroll through time and figure out what's going on. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, uh, you can, like I said earlier, you can go back in time, which is actually very helpful to be able to, to do in some certain uh, really tricky bugs. So again, like open source hardware is cute, it, but it could be useful for people who are not into software. Maybe there's a reason that if you, if you, if you were looking at a particular CPU and if, you, if it had the RTL available to you, you can do tricks like this. So that's a difference in terms of the visibility and debugability that you get into the system. So, um, you know, hypothetically, if you had the source code for the CPU and they would give it to you, you could do things like microarchitectural side channel mitigations, but more practically and just demonstrated right now, we can do debugging and performance profiling. So you need a full open source hardware and software stack to do that. 
But even if you are kind of using sham memory at the end of the day, if you're not performance profiling, you at least capture the instruction set correctness and you can you can get through um, hairy bugs that way. Um, and, uh, you know, it allows you to sort of root cause tricky bugs in a single shot. You don't have to rerun the thing over and over and keep loading it into your into your target hardware. Um, you can you can analyze performance uh, problems with zero overhead. So there's no instrumentation overhead. You're getting the actual performance uh, issues uh, played out. And you can look at stuff that's tricky, the Heisenbugs, TLB, cache state, whatever it is, and figure out what's going on without interfering with it. So that's it. I guess I'm a little bit early, but I think we're running behind, so it's probably okay. Thanks. Well, 